All right, we are on the second part of the 2.06 lesson, and we left off with Cuba, remember the main. And the sun's kind of in my eyes here, so hopefully it's not glaring too bad on the video, but I'm not going to complain because I'm happy to see the sun. <laughs> Cuba, remember the main. In the last decades in the 19th century, Americans and grew grew increasingly interested in Cuba, a Caribbean island still part of the Spanish Empire. American businesses invested heavily in the island sugar and cigar industries. In 1895, when an uprising broke out against Spanish rule, most Americans sympathized with the rebels. Their sympathy increased when they learned the Spanish were attempting to put down the rebellion by herding Cubans into overcrowded prison camps where tens of thousands died of disease. Expansionist politicians began calling for the United States to enter the conflict, both to assert its own interests and help the Cubans. Many first and second generation immigrants seeking to affirm their allegiances to the United States also supported conflict with Spain. At the same time, popular newspapers like The World, owned by Joseph Pulitzer and the New York Journal, owned New York Journal, owned by William Randolph Hearst, beat the drums for war with Spain. Competing to increase circulation and eager to sell more copies, these newspaper, newspapers engaged in yellow journalism, in which factual reporting gave way to eye-catching headlines and sensationalistic stories. Both newspapers ran exaggerated stories of Spanish cruelty and Cuban heroism. So, just stop here for a minute. This is a little different from muckraking. Muckrakers, remember, were journalists that were to try to expose corruption, society's ills. But they were using factual reporting. They were investigating, using research. Whereas yellow journalism is exaggeration. And I think about it as today's type of like National Enquirer um, type magazines. That's a little more of the yellow journalist type. Okay, so back here. In February 1898, the New York Journal further stoked anti-Spanish feeling when it published a stolen letter in which the Spanish ambassador in Washington mocked President William McKinley. Worst insult to the United States in its history, blared the headline in the journal. Later the same month, the Maine, an American battleship sent to protect Americans in Cuba, blew up in Havana Harbor, harbor killing more than 260 people, sailors. Theodore Roosevelt at one time, an assistant secretary of the Navy wrote that the Maine was sunk by an act of dirty treachery on the part of the Spaniards. The New York Journal reported the ship had been destroyed by a Spanish mine, and this banner headline, Remember the Maine! To hell was Spain! The cause of the Maine sinking was never determined, and many historians today blame it on an accidental explosion inside the ship. But in the spring of 1898, war historians sweep swept the nation. President McKinley, a Civil War veteran, at first hoped to avoid fighting. I have been through one war, he said. I have seen the dead piled up, and I do not want to see another. But in April 1898, after negotiations with the Spanish broke down, Congress declared war on Spain. A splendid little war. Spain's empire had once contained vast territories, including much of Central and South America. By the late 19th century, however, Spain held only a few important colonies, Cuba and Puerto Rico in the Caribbean, and the Philippine Islands in the Eastern Pacific. Over the course of a century, Spain's wealth and power declined while America's rose. American, America's military advantage was most obvious at sea. The United States had a larger and far more modern fleet of warships than Spain. One Spanish naval commander contemplating combat at sea with the Americans mournfully wrote, We may and must expect a disaster. The American army, by contrast, was relatively small, with only 28,000 troops in early 1898. It was also poorly trained and equipped. Nor were American soldiers prepared for the special hazards of combat on a tropical island like Cuba, with sweltering heat and outbreaks of lethal diseases like yellow fever. What American troops lacked in training, they made up for in enthusiasm. In the course of the Spanish-American War, roughly 200,000 volunteers joined the 28,000 regulars. Eager to experience battle, Theodore Roosevelt resigned from the Navy Department to raise and help lead a volunteer cavalry regiment known as the Rough Riders. The Rough Riders boasted a cross-section of Americans, including Native Americans, cowboys from New Mexico, and college athletes. When they arrived in Cuba, Roosevelt's men and the other American troops found themselves outnumbered by the enemy. But the Spanish soldiers were worn out from fighting Cuban rebels and poorly supplied because of an American blockade of the island. The United States won a swift victory in what, Amer what an American diplomat called a splendid little war. The Battle for Cuba. At the end of June 1898, American forces landed in Cuba and advanced on the city of Santiago, the headquarters of the Spanish forces. On July 1st, they fought the only major land battle of the war, the Battle of San Juan Hill, named after a ridge overlooking Santiago. In the course of the battle, 
Colonel Theodore Roosevelt led his Rough Riders on a brave but reckless assault on the strong Spanish position atop adjacent Kettle Hill. The Rough Riders, along with units of African American soldiers, rushed up the slope under the murderous rifle fire, which Roosevelt later remembered as sounding like the ripping of a silk dress. When some of his men hung back, Roosevelt roared, Are you afraid to stand up when I am on horseback? Roosevelt carried a revolver salvaged from the wreck of the Maine. He had vowed to kill at least one Spaniard with it. As he rode through a hail of bullets, one nicked his elbow. Then he saw a Spanish soldier a few yards away and shot him, watching the man collapse, as he later recalled, neatly as a jackrabbit. That Roosevelt. <laughs> He's like quite the character. The fierce American assault drove the Spanish off Kettle Hill. Roosevelt later remembered the battle as the great day of my life. Roosevelt's boldness would bring him home to a hero's welcome and make him the rising political star of the Republican Party. And here's a artist rendition of the Battle of San Juan Hill. Having captured the heights above Santiago, the American forces bombarded the city into submission. On July 17th, the Spanish commander surrendered. Spanish rule in Cuba came to an end. Puerto Rico. After defeating the Spanish in Cuba, American commanders turned their attention to Spain's other important colony in the Caribbean, the island of Puerto Rico. The inhabitants of the island had a long history of resistance to Spanish rule. In response, Spain had recently granted Puerto Rico a large degree of self-rule. Nevertheless, after the Americans landed, they found themselves welcomed by the majority of the native people. Facing only light Spanish resistance, U.S. troops quickly seized the island. The new military governor of Puerto Rico promised its inhabitants blessings of the American form of government, but the new American possession had an uncertain political status. In 1917, inhabitants of the island were granted American citizenship. Still, Puerto Rico had never become a state. Today, Puerto Rico remains part of the United States as a commonwealth. Its inhabitants elect their own governor and legislature, but they do not vote in the national presidential election. Though American citizens, they have only a non-voting delegate in the U.S. Congress. The Philippines in 1898, the largest of Spain's colonial possessions was the Philippines, a chain of islands in the eastern Pacific. Expansionists like Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt coveted these islands as a base for American power in Asia. Even before the outbreak of the Spanish-American War, Roosevelt had directed Commodore George Dewey, the U.S. naval commander in Asia, to prepare an assault on the Philippines. In May, on May 1st, six days after the declaration of war, Dewey's squadron steamed into Manila Bay, where the Spanish fleet was anchored. On the squadron's flagship, the Olympia, Commodore Dewey began the Battle of Manila Bay with these matter-of-fact words to his captain, You may fire when you are ready, Gridley. In a few hours, Dewey's modern warships easily destroyed the old Spanish vessels. Within weeks, American troops occupied Manila, the capital city of the Philippines. The Battle of Manila Bay made Dewey a hero of the Spanish-American War. He was promoted to an admiral, and the world took note of the emergence of the United States as a major naval power. Extending the American Empire The Spanish-American War officially ended with the signing of the Treaty of Paris on December 10, 1898. Another Treaty of Paris! We have so many Treaty of Parises in U.S. history. The terms of this treaty extended the holdings of the American Empire. Puerto Rico became a territory of the United States. So did Guam, a small island in the Pacific, and the Philippines, for which the United States agreed to pay $20 million to Spain. President McKinley justified the takeover of the Philippines by saying that unless the United States assumed control of the islands, they would fall prey to the imperial goals of France, Britain, or Germany. Furthermore, said McKinley, reflecting to the attitudes of his time, it was the duty of the Americans to not just protect the Filipinos, but to uplift and civilize them. The Treaty of Paris made Cuba an American protectorate. It was technically independent, but in fact under American control. While American troops remained stationed in Cuba, Congress considered what to do. American businessmen did not want the United States to give up all control of Cuba since they feared the shaky political situation in the island might put their investments at risk. In 1901, through a piece of legislation known as the Platt Amendment, Congress agreed to grant Cuba independence, but with many strings attached. Before American troops would leave the island, the Platt Amendment required the Cubans amend their constitution to grant the United States certain rights and powers. Cuba accepted strict limitations on its right to make treaties and agreed not to transfer land to any other nation but the United States. Cuba also gave the United States control over a naval base at Guantanamo Bay. Never hear of Guantanamo Bay in the news? It's still in there. Finally, Cuba agreed the United States would intervene in Cuba for the preservation of Cuban independence. 
anti-imperialist response. Let's look at this cartoon first. In this 1900 cartoon, an empire-hungry Uncle Sam ponders his choice, choices as President McKinley ways to take the order. And if you look at his menu here, we have a Cuba steak, a Puerto Rico pig, and the Filipino floating islands, sandwich islands. Uh, there are his menu choices. The anti-imperialist response. To some influential Americans, the Spanish-American War undermined any claim by the United States to moral superiority over the European empires. To some influential Americans, the Spanish-American War undermined any claim by the United States to moral superiority over the European empires. A senator from Massachusetts worried that we are to be transformed from a republic founded on the Declaration of Independence into a vulgar, commonplace empire founded upon physical force. A new organization called the Anti-Imperialist League attracted members as diverse as the writer Mark Twain, the labor leader Samuel Gompers, and the former president Grover Cleveland. The anti-imperialists had mixed reasons for their opposition to American expansion overseas. Some argued that it subverted American ideals and violated the Constitution. Others charged that it harmed American workers by causing an influx of cheap labor. And some expressed worries grounded in racism to the, about the addition of millions of non-white people to American territory. Rebellion in the Philippines Anti-imperialists prote protested loudly when in February 1899 a rebellion broke out against American rule in the Philippines. For the next three years, American troops battled against nationalist guerrillas. Rebel atrocities led to fearsome American reprisals. One soldier recounted, Last night, one of our boys was found shot and his stomach cut open. Immediately orders were received to burn the town and kill every native in sight. In 1901, a rebel leader, Emilio Aguilonado, was captured, and the war ended by the next year. More than 4,000 Americans had died, as had 16,000 Filipino soldiers. An estimated 200,000 Filipino civil civilians died, mostly from war-related famine and disease. The United States would not grant the Philippines its independence until 1946. Okay, let's finish off the lesson here. So we're back. We have to complete the Birchville field trip, a question of war activity. So here we go. The Spanish-American War was a questionable one begun without clear provocation or definite causes. Many Americans supported the idea of Cuban independence from Spain, but yellow journalism was also a contributor, particularly when the battleship Maine blew up under <coughs> mysterious circumstances and the press exploited the tragedy. In the end, the United States did go to war. Declaring war is a very serious act. In the United States, it's Congress. it is Congress that declares war. The commitments of personnel and materials, plus demands on the civilian population, require careful thought and close examination of many factors. Just what are the questions of Congress, the President, and the people should ask before supporting a decision to go to war? Investigate the following websites to determine some of the most important questions to ask. When you are finished, it says you can write in your history journal, but you know that's not required. That's just an optional exercise that you can do for your own um, thoughts and understanding. Okay, here we go. Read the introduction from the beginning through the section called the United States. Are there questions you would ask about the situation in any of the territories involved in the run-up to war? Questions about U.S. interest in those territories? Questions about Spanish imperialism? Okay, so let's just look through this here quickly. So this is a PBS site. No, this is a Library of Congress. And it goes through, um, giving some background, some information about Cuba and Puerto Rico. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of running out of time. I don't want to make another video just to do this virt virtual field trip. Um, but I'm just going to show it to you, get you the exposure there. The next part, in 1898, newspapers were the primary sources of information for most people. Read the yellow journalism page to discover how the press at the time got its nickname. Pay particular attention to the last paragraph. Okay, let's look. And this is a PBS site. Let's look at the last paragraph. Today, historians point to the Spanish-American War as the first press-driven war. Though it may be an exaggeration to claim that Hearst and the other yellow journalists started the war, it is fair to say the press fueled the public's passion for war. Without sensational headlines and stories about Cuban affairs, the mood for the Cuban intervention may have been very different. At the dawn of the 20th century, the United States emerged as a world power, and the U.S. press proved its influence. Okay, and then the last part, now visit the destruction of the U.S. Maine, and I think this link is broken, actually. Yes, it is. Um, but don't forget now to close off the lesson by taking the 2.06 checkpoint. This, there was no online activity to get a keyword, so this should be a short one with just two questions. Yep, there you go. So finish that off, ladies and gents. Good luck, 
and um, see you in the next video. Bye-bye.